Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Are you renting or buying? If I can draw your attention to verse number 12 where God says to Noah, yeah, this is going to be the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for the generations to come. I've set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Anybody looking for a sign? Help us, Holy Ghost. Anybody looking for a sign? I know we can almost halfway feel a little uncomfortable about admitting that we're looking for a sign because we remember in Matthew chapter 12, I think, and in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus says that it's a wicked and an adulterous generation that looks for a sign. So sometimes if you were raised like some of us, they almost made you feel bad about looking for a sign, and you almost feel guilty about it, although really what Jesus is saying is, is you're looking for a miraculous sign, really to test to see if I really am the Christ. And so we have to be okay about, about the idea of signs. And here we are in the Old Testament. I mean, signs must be okay if God said, this is the sign. If the Lord said, and this will be a sign to you that this is going to happen, then clearly it must be all right to look for signs. And so I'm going to ask it one more time. Anybody looking for a sign? I'm looking for a sign. I'm looking for a confirmation. I'm looking for favor. I'm looking for a miracle. I'm looking for something to happen. I'm looking for the Lord to confirm to me that he is on my side. I am looking for stuff to take place that I could not explain. I am looking for miracles, signs, and wonders. I am looking for a sign to give me a confirmation that God himself, the God of peace, is going to do something on my behalf. Good God. I am looking as much as I'm believing and praying and trusting and as much as folks speak words of life to me, praise God for it. But once I hear a word of life, I'm looking for a confirmation of that. Once I hear a word from the Lord, I'm looking for a confirmation that that word applies to me. I'm looking for a sign. And I, 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 I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm looking for signs and wonders. As a matter of fact, Part of my prayer for us is that signs and wonders will break out among us. I'm saying, Lord, confirm your word with signs following. Help us. Lord, confirm the word by more than an amen. Confirm the word by a miracle that will take place. Lord, do more than confirm Canaan as just a, ooh, what a word, Pastor. Confirm Canaan by making Canaan break out amongst us. God, confirm Canaan by there being Canaan things that you cannot explain and stuff taking place that I could not do it in my own strength. I'm looking for a sign. I'm looking for wonders. I'm looking for miracles. I'm, I'm looking for favor. I'm looking for blessing. I'm looking for the hand of God. And I don't want to talk too much about what God's going to do till I see that sign. I'm looking for a sign. I'm determined to find these signs. And I'm saying, Lord, where's the signs? Maybe a part of the reason why we don't quite see the signs that we're looking for, I know very often, I'm saying, Lord, Where's the sign? How will I know what's the confirmation? What miraculous sign will you give me to know that this is going to take place? I contend that a part of the reason why we don't always see the signs is because the sign of what God is trying to show us and the sign that we're looking for, not always the same thing. The sign that God is promising is a sign of his covenant. God's signs are about covenant. We want signs about our miracle. Hallelujah. We want signs about our blessing. We want signs that the word we read or the promise we heard or the prophecy we got, we want a sign that that's going to come to pass. And the signs that we're talking about right now and the signs that the Lord promises are signs about covenant signs about covenant we're looking for signs about promises but really the Lord says let me tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to give you a sign but the sign is going to be a sign of the covenant between me and you because God is about covenant and a covenant, I'll just give it, the Lord said this to me this afternoon, a covenant is an agreement 
you make before the blessing happens. A covenant is an agreement you make before you get your money. You say, Lord, when you bless me, I'm going to give this to you. The, the, the covenant is what you make before you get to the land. He says, I'm going to make this covenant between me and you. And after this, you're going to do this so that you won't forget me when you get to your place. The covenant is an agreement that I make before I get to everything I'm asking for. Before I get all the stuff I'm praying for, the Lord says, yeah, but I want you to make me a cake first. Yeah, but I want you to commit to me first. Yeah, but I want to make sure that you're all in first, and I'll give you a sign of my covenant between us. That the signs that God is trying to show me is a sign of the covenant. And in these two particular passages, it's what's connected in the two passages is in both passages, God talks to Noah and God talks to Abram, then Abraham, about covenant. Talks to him about covenant. I, as much as I want to preach to you about blessing and preach to you about Canaan, certainly believe God for Canaan and believe in God for blessing. But Canaan happens with people who's trying to be about covenant. Trying to say, all right, Lord, I'm going to make an agreement with you. Lord, I'm, Lord, I'm all in. Before you even make a way for me, I'm all in. And if I'm one of these people that is drawing lines in the sand that God has got to hop over to prove to me who he is, before I'm all in, I got another thing coming. God is looking for somebody that's got faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For whoever must comes to him must first believe that he exists and that that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Am I in a word or not? That I have to say, all right, I got to seek first the kingdom and then everything else will be added unto me as well. I don't get to everything else and then decide to seek first the kingdom. That the sign is a sign of the covenant. And there's two signs of the covenant that that. We talked about in these two particular passages that I felt led of the Lord and of the Spirit of God to share with you and everyone that's watching these two signs of the covenant. The first sign of the covenant, okay, if you're taking notes, and we just read it in, for, in, in Genesis chapter 9, the first sign of the covenant, number one, was a rainbow. The rainbow is what you see after the storm. What you see after the storm, something bright, something colorful, something amazing. It's incredible that God put something in the sky after the flood to say, after your storm passes over, the light's going to pass through the clouds. And as the clouds peel back from your life, there will be a sign unto you that we are in covenant with one another. And I don't know about you, but one of the confirmations to me that I've got a covenant with God is I'm still breathing after the storm. I'm still breathing after the stuff with I'm still breathing after the flood. That what meant to kill me has actually bolstered me and given me a confirmation and a testimony and an experience that he is my rock and I cannot be shaken. That after the storm, that's where I really get to see a sign that me and God are in this thing together. You don't have a covenant if you can't make it through a storm with me. Get out of here. You're not my friend if you only my friend when everything's amazing. What happens when the rain clears up? What happens when the clouds clear out? Can I see something as a sign of the covenant between us? The Lord said, I'm going to tell you what. Every time there's storms, every time there's clouds, I'm going to throw something in the sky as a sign unto to you that we are in covenant with each other. That's the first sign of the covenant that we looked in. And then the second sign of the covenant that we looked at in these two particular passages is circumcision, a portion of the seed. It's a sign, a portion of the seed. Circumcision is a cutting away of the skin of that seed 
dispenser. Gentlemen, it's what we all have. Ultimately, every man in here has a dispenser of seed. Oh, hallelujah. And to take a knife to that dispenser of seed and to say, I'm cutting away a portion of this seed dispenser, which is very important to me, never to take it again is a, is a picture of the fact that I'm deciding that any seed I produce, there is going to be a portion of that seed that I'm going to give. So everybody in here has a seed dispenser. Everybody in here that gives, that ties, that produces, that's wealth, that we are giving seed, that a sign of my covenant is my circumcision. What I cut away is a sign to me that I have covenant. What is what I what I see after the storm passes over is a sign that I have covenant. Every time I give, it's a sign that I have covenant. And if I'm shaky about covenant, it's because I don't see right after the storm. If I'm shaky about covenant, it's because when I look down, I don't see circumcision. So that I'm looking for a sign, and the Lord is saying, oh, I'll give you some signs. Number one, my rainbow will be a sign. And number two, circumcision will be a sign unto you. They are signs that I am in covenant with God. Signs that I am in covenant with God. And believe me, you want covenant with God. You want covenant with God. I tell you, God is a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. And it's why I titled this message, Are You Renting or Are You Buying? Because are we just here just to rent God for the weekend or are we all in? We kind of trying to get God to just bless us for a moment or are we on the verge and prepared for a covenant relationship with God in which I say, all right, I'm going to make a covenant with God, and these are going to be the signs to me that I'm in covenant with him that I want to stop renting and buy, that I can't just take the treasure out the field. I have to go and sell everything I have and come back and buy the field. I got to bury that treasure again because it's not really mine if I'm only renting. If all I do is just come and get a little blessing every now and then, then I'm really missing the true real benefit of relationship with God. That I, I may get something a little bit, but it's totally different when it becomes mine. If I just decide I'm just going to have a, oh, I'm going to get a little prayer. Hey, can you pray for me for a second? Hey, can you, can, can you say a blessing over me? Hey, can you throw a prayer up in the sky for me? People say that kind of stuff to me all the time. And I'm like, no, I, I hear you. I totally get it. And certainly you can benefit, I suppose, from a weekend with the Lord. But it's totally different when you buy in. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. Totally different when you decide, okay, I'm done renting and I'm actually ready for this idea of relationship with God that is a covenant with God. And we have to be all right with that. And we have to be careful that our rent mentality does not get us to miss the idea that a real commitment with God is what is required. Help us, Holy Ghost. We have to be careful that in a generation in which we just want to live together, that we miss the fact, that we don't miss the fact that there's something about covenant that when we look at the biggest guy who is the father of the faith to us Abraham Abraham didn't just have an encounter with God Abraham had a covenant with God Abraham entered into an agreement with God God said as for me this is my part I'm going to do this as for you this is your part you keep your covenant with me I'll keep my covenant with you you keep your covenant with me and not only will it affect you, it'll affect the descendants after you. 
Matter of fact, this relationship we'll build can be so strong that your babies, babies can benefit from the benefit of the agreement that you make with me. That's what kind of covenant keeper I am. That's what God says. God says, when I keep a covenant, your great-grandchildren get the benefit of the covenant. If y'all can just keep the covenant. If you teach them to be careful to obey what I command you, oh my God, not only will this covenant be with you, but it'll be with the descendants after you. Can I get a witness in the building? That if I understand that what God is looking for from me is more than just patronage, he wants membership. He don't want me to just stop in the store and buy something every now and then. He wants me to sign up for the card. He wants me to pay the membership fee. He wants a premium membership from me. He wants to know that we're in covenant with one another, that I begin to realize that God is a God of covenant. When I look at the Bible, I really do see the Bible as a sales pitch for covenant. That's what I see. It makes me say, when I read the Bible, the Bible says to me, wow, if I could just stop renting and buy. If, I, if this is what happened to somebody that had a one-time encounter with God, then I'm not looking just to have a one-time encounter with him. I'm looking to have a consistent relationship with him. I want to enter into covenant with God. That God is a covenant maker and God is a covenant keeper. So when I look at the Bible, I really do see it as a sales pitch for covenant. And when I look at the scriptures and I look at the counsel of God and I look at people in their relationship with God and I see real covenant with God, I see real covenant with God based on really these these. Seven foundations of covenant. So if any of us are kind of like, well, covenant with God, eh, that, that maybe it's because we've been sold covenant with God that is separate from these foundational stones of covenant with God. When I look at God and his relationship with people, what God is interested in with us is to be our God and for us to be his people. He's looking for us to be married. We are the bride of Christ. He's looking for us to have connection together. He wants us to take his name. And so when we start to talk about the covenant that we have with God, especially when I look at the word of God, I see that there are these foundations, these foundational stones throughout the scriptures that a covenant with God is based upon. And I see seven of them because I see sevens and everything. And I'm going to share with you these seven foundations of a covenant relationship with God. And I'm going to pray for you to have covenant with him. And I'm going to let you go. The first foundation stone that I see, that the first foundation that a, that a covenant with God is based on, number one, is the presence of God. The presence of God. Part of the reason why we come in here and we spend as much time worshiping the Lord as we do is because we're trying to get you to walk in covenant with God. But it's very difficult to walk in covenant with God if you never sense the presence of God. Whenever I have a conversation with the worship team and we're talking about music and new music, we're always talking about new music. And we always try to add new music because I realize that new music ushers you into the presence of God. Music ushers you into the presence of God. And music has supernatural power to make you sense the presence of God. Problem is, you sing a song too much, first time you heard it, it took you right to the throne room. Fiftieth time you sang it, it's not as powerful to take you there as it used to be. And so we have to add new music so that we can continually be moved by the supernatural to sense the presence of God. Because if I don't sense his presence, then I'm not as interested in covenant. Covenant gets weak without the presence. Covenant gets weak without the presence. So if every Sunday I sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Now, if I go back to the old church oh, and, and, and go in the old church and they sing, this is my story. I, f I ain't sang that song in so long. I feel God when we sing praise and my Savior. I feel it because I don't sing it every week. But if you sing it every, sing, every week, if you sing it every month, what happens is it starts to lose the power to usher you into the presence of God. And without the presence of God, a covenant with God is weaker. 
You're not as interested in the covenant with God because one of the foundation stones of a covenant with God is his presence. So the presence of God is a foundation stone for a covenant with God. Number two, prayer and praise is a foundation stone for covenant with God. Part of the reason why we're trying to teach you how to pray, part of the reason why we spent 20, 30, 40 minutes worshiping, this was not entertainment. This was not a show. This was for you to participate. Help us, Holy Ghost. This was for you to learn how to raise your hand and open up your mouth. That's why when I say clap your hands, I tell you, tell God something. Because you are going to have to praise him. Or, and you're going to have to pray. You have to activate this with your mouth. Covenant loses access without prayer and praise. You can't pray. Your access gets fuzzy. You can't praise. Your access gets fuzzy. And covenant without access is not that powerful. So one of the foundations of this covenant that makes covenant even palatable is prayer and praise. Part of the reason why we spend an amount of time in here praising and make you get on your feet, try to get you to lift your hands, and try to get you to open up your mouth is because we're trying to maintain that, that access port to you and God so that you can keep that covenant going. You fall out of covenant with him if you don't hold on to the access that you have to him. Number three, third foundation of covenant is promises. Promises. <laughs> that as a result of the promises of God, if I'm not aware of the promises and I'm not standing on the promises, I, covenant's not as powerful. That, that covenant lacks appeal without promises. Covenant starts to lack its appeal without promises. That the promises of God hold me in to my part of the covenant, that's not easy to do. If I'm not aware of the promises, if I'm not standing on any promise, then covenant can start to lose an appeal to me because there's no promise connected to the covenant. The only reason why I'm in covenant is because I'm scared to go to hell. Then it's not going to be as appealing to me if there's promises that are connected to the covenant. So I've got to be aware of the promises. Part of the reason why the Lord says to Abraham, hey, I'll do this for you and I'll do that for you. If you keep your covenant with me is because one of the foundation stones of the covenant is a promise from God. For all of us who were raised only being obedient based on the threat of punishment, there's another way to get obedience, and that's through the promise of blessing. And we have to realize that the Lord knows how we're formed. And so he says, hey, listen, if you stick tight to this covenant, I'll bless you in the city. And I'll bless you in the field. And I'll bless the work of your hands. And I'll bless everything you touch. And I'll bless your seed. That that promise that I receive from God maintains the appeal of this of this covenant relationship that I have with God, that the promise is, is a foundation for covenant. Y'all still with me? Have a lost you. You're away. Okay, and I'm teaching you something. Number four, what's the fourth foundation of covenant? It's principles. Principles. That, that there is a principle. A principle is a law. A principle is a truth that anybody can stand on. That the prince, that covenant needs the structure of principles. Covenant needs that structure of principles. That without a principle, the covenant will lack boundaries. Without the principle, there will be no structure for the covenant to be formed in. Now, I know that we want to live in a world with no structure and no judgment and nobody, everybody just wants to do whatever they want to do and what seems right in their own eyes. But a principle is a thing that gives you a guarantee that the word will work for you. And so I, I've got to be aware of the promises 
I also have to be aware of the truths that are connected to the promises. I have to be aware of the principles because if I can work the principles, then it's past just who I am. It's how I'm walking in this principle, that I will reap a harvest if I faint not. So there are some things that I'm doing purely based on principle. I'm not doing those things because I feel like doing it. I'm doing it because there's a principle involved, and that principle lends structure to my covenant relationship. Without the principle, my relationship lacks structure. Number five, the fifth. (laughs) The fifth foundation of covenant is prophecy. Prophecy. They're all peace because I'm a preacher. Prophecy is is the fifth foundation of covenant, meaning that God is making me a promise that is thrown into the future. That prophecy is that covenant is driven by faith fueled by prophecy. Covenant is driven by faith that is fueled by prophecy. The best way to have faith is to have a prophetic word. Good God help us, Holy Ghost. I don't know if you've ever had a prophetic word or you had a prophetic dream or the late Lord gave you a vision. You was about to give up your faith on believing what you was about to, ha- about to say. And then someone came to you and said a word to you and spoke something to you. And that prophecy made you say, "Woo! it's time to hold on. God's about to turn this thing around for me. That actually, a part of why I don't give up on covenant is because the Lord has given me a glimpse into where I'm going. And as a result of the prophecy, as a result of the vision, this is why the Lord is pouring out His Spirit on all flesh. And for young men to dream dreams, and for young men to see visions, old men to dream dreams, and young men to see visions. For us, for, for men and women to have this encounter with the Holy Spirit is because a people with prophecy is a people more likely to keep covenant. Hey, I got a problem. Someone spoke a prophetic word. The Lord gave me a dream. The Lord gave me a vision. I'm walking according to that. And my faith is not just based on having faith. My faith is based on this word that I believe is spoken over me. And this vision that the Lord gave me. And the confirmations I've had about that vision. I'm looking for things to confirm to me that the Lord has made a promise to me and that prophetic glimpse is a part of what keeps that covenant that I have with God. I'm holding on to God's unchanging hand because the Lord has given me a glimpse into where I'm going and I can't let go now. I'm too deep in and I actually have a dream and so I got to maintain this relationship with God because I, it's, it's, it's part of the foundation of it is this prophetic this, this prophecy and this prophetic plan that I have from the Lord is a part of what keeps me locked into this covenant I have with them. Number six, I'm just about done. Sixth foundation of covenant is purpose. Purpose. That covenant becomes directionless without purpose. That as a result of the purpose for which God sent his word, then my covenant with his word is much more impactful if the word is after a purpose. And even more, the the idea of covenant with God has much more meaning to me if I'm determined to walk in my purpose. Matter of fact, if I'm saying, no, no, Lord, this is what you've called me to. Lord, you've actually called me to be an air traffic controller. And so, Lord, I'm going to maintain my covenant with you because I realize that as a result of my connection with you, I get to walk in my purpose. And as a result of walking in my purpose, it makes the relationship with God even more palatable because the safest place is chasing after the purpose and the will of God for my life. And what's more is I realize that there's a blessing that's attached to me being walking in purpose. And so I, I, I got to be aware of purpose. That's why the word says all things work together for the good and love God called according to his purpose because purpose is a part of what keeps you there. Purpose is a part of what keeps you in that relationship. Purpose is a part of what keeps covenant palatable. Purpose is a part of what makes me say, all right, I'm in this thing because of the purpose of my life. 
that I've decided to stay faithful because there is a purpose for which God has sent me. And i got to stay faithful to him to fulfill my purpose. If all I'm doing is just living my life for pleasure, then covenant with God is not as important. I've been working out, you know, I'm working out, working out. Hallelujah, praise God, working out. And it's one thing to work out, something else all together, to work out with somebody, training for a season. You, that, uh, there's, that, and when you, if you ever see someone training for a sports season, you're just training to be cute. They are training for a contract. Two totally different things. They have a whole nother level of commitment and covenant to the gym than you do. You're going because you're paying the membership <laughs> and you don't want to waste it. They're paying because their purpose is connected to how much they squat. They can't skip a leg day because their knees bothering them a little. Enough. They got to, there is a purpose way which they're connected to it. And I realize that I've got a whole nother commitment to this relationship with God when that relationship with God is connected to purpose. And I need the anointing of God to walk in that purpose. And then finally, number seven, and I'm done, is that the seventh foundation of covenant is power. Power. That covenant needs power to sustain it, that <laughs> I want the power of God available to me, it makes the covenant sustainable. When I know I have access to power, when I know I can call and God will move on my behalf. When I know he is just a prayer away. When I know that there's results in this relationship, then I'm much more likely to be interested in the relationship. The relationship is not as sustainable without power. If the one I'm connected to has no power, then what good is it? That as a result of my confidence that there is an anointing and an access to power that is connected to covenant. Hey, I'm looking to maintain that access and that commitment and that covenant with someone that has power. I'll deal even with the challenges that go along with that covenant if it gives me access to power. If I'm saying, oh, okay, God, all right, I understand that this is what you require, but God, it is worth it if I'm walking in the power of God. And when we get separated and disconnected from God's power, then covenant does not seem as appealing. In a world where everything else has power but God, why have covenant with God? Part of the reason why the Lord has power available to me is to keep me interested in covenant with him. There are all these benefits to covenant, and the power of God is a part of what enables me to sustain my covenant relationship with him. What's the point I've made tonight? The point I've made tonight is God is interested in covenant. God is interested in me making some promises. God is interested in me making some agreements before everything happens. God is interested in me saying, all right, Lord, I'm getting ready to fight. Lord, I'll take this. I, Lord, you do this for me. Lord, I, 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 Lord, this is the vow I'm making. Lord, this is my life that I'm giving you. Lord, I'm giving it to you before I walk in the promise, before I walk in the blessing, before I get to the thing. Lord, I want you to know that I'm in this thing for real, that I'm in covenant with God, that I have a relationship with him. And as a result of that covenant that I have with God, there's an access to power that I would not have without that covenant, that I don't want to just rent forever. I want to buy. 
you heard a word from the Lord, put your hands together. Praise the Lord. Jump up on your feet. Reach out somebody's hand. Grab somebody's hand. Let's pray for one another. Lord, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for this group. Thank you, Lord God, for this moment. Thank you for this Wednesday night service. Thank you for your anointing that is available to all of us. Thank you that you are a covenant-making God and you are a covenant-keeping God. Lord, help us to be careful not to be so much about the blessings that we disconnect, get disconnected from the idea of covenant. Thank you, Lord God, that covenant is available to us. Who are we that you would even be mindful of us, let alone to come down and make covenant with us and give us signs of the covenant? God, I thank you right now for the covenant that we're making with you. God, we make a covenant today, Lord God, to serve you and, and that you'll be our God and we'll be your people and that we will praise you and that we'll be obedient to you and that we'll keep your commands and that, God, we'll walk in your ways and that, Lord, we will circumcise and that, God, we will see the signs and that, God, we won't be shaken by storms. God, I pray that we will chase after covenant even more than we chase after blessing and that we will be a people that is about covenant even more than a people that is about results that even if the results aren't there yet the covenant sustains us even if the blessing hasn't happened yet the covenant sustains us God we surrender our lives to your will and to your way we want you to know Lord that we're all in lead us and guide us into all truth God, we, you said you would never leave us nor forsake us. God, we want you to know that your faithfulness will be matched by ours. Even though we fall short and miss the mark, God, test us and see if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. You've been our help. Thank you for living in and so big in us tonight. Thank you for this group that you gathered together, a group too great to number. Thank you not just for us, but for our children's children's children. Thank you for this covenant that won't just impact us, but impact the generations to come. And not just the generations to come in us, but God, impact our area. Do it, we pray. Fill this room. Fill our lives. God, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your presence. Fill us, God with offers, oh hallelujah, scholarship opportunities. Fill us, Lord God, with peace that passes understanding. Fill us, God, with healing. Fill us full of yourself. Lord, empty us of our fear. Fill us up with the God kind of faith. Have your way in us tonight, and we'll give you praise. And as we always pray, Lord, bless your people. Make your face shine upon your people. Be gracious to your people. Give us peace. In Jesus' name we pray. We all sit together. Amen. God bless you. Greet somebody in the name of the Lord. Give somebody a holy hug. You are dismissed. God bless you.